Welcome to all of you. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to join us today for this Plant Shift uh, seminar. We're delighted to have you. And uh, at the outset, I want to just thank Northeastern University for taking time and realizing the importance of this topic and carving out space for these important conversations. And we also want to reach out and say thank you to Sebastiano and Jane Castiglione for the vision and the innovation and the support of this program. They are an incredible couple uh, that demonstrate the power of unity and are transforming the world. So we just want to recognize uh, their investment in this project. I'd like to just take a minute to uh, introduce our panel today. And uh, for you all that are joining us, um, these may be new names, but I just want you to recognize that uh, Seva and Jane have brought together an incredible panel of people that have uh, an, uh, years and years of experience in this area and are really experts in their field. First, I'd like to introduce Chef Nina Curtis. She's mm -hmm. the director and executive chef at Adventist Health in um, California and Culinary Arts Department. She is a culinary contest winner of the Culinary Institute of America, Harvard School of Public Health, Menus of Change, and an initiative that teamed with Healthcare Without Harm and practice uh, green health uh, and won the 2019 grand prize. She's a member of the Google Food Lab, head chef at James Beard Foundation in 2018, the International Women's Day Dinner, uh, Women and the Future of Food. She is a board member of the Plant-Based Prevention and Disease, former vice president of Women's Chefs and Restaurants, uh, you may have seen uh, Chef Nina on Blue Zone speaker team. Uh, she's spoken on Live Kindly, Vegan Chefs, Who We Are, The Food System, PETA 26, Women Entrepreneurs Who Use the Influence to Help Animals, Plant-Based Prevention of Disease, Distinguished Chef Series, Table Talk, Vegan uh, Veganary Edition, New York Live TV, and on and on. And a very interesting accomplishment that uh, maybe she'll talk about briefly is that she was a former professional bodybuilder. So she really understands the link between nutrition and, and physical health in, in many unique ways. Yeah. And we are also honored today to have Kathy Freston. She is a New York Times bestselling author of multiple books, including The Lean Veganist, Quantum Wellness, and The Quantum Wellness Cleanse. She has recent book titles, including Clean Protein, 72 Reasons to Be Vegan, Veganish, She's a contributor to the Huffington Post, featured author in Vanity Fair, Fitness South, Harper's Bazaar. Uh, you may have seen Kathy on many TV shows, including Oprah, The Dr. Oz Show, Ellen, Charlie Rose, Good Morning America, The Talk, Martha Stewart, The Good Food Institute, and many, many more. She's currently team board member of the Good Food Institute, and uh, her accomplishments include animal wellness activist, volunteer, and last chance for animals vegan of the year award. So welcome, Chef Nina and Kathy. It's a delight to have you, and, and uh, thank you for spending some time with us today. Great to be it's here. Delight. It's a delight to be here. That is great. Uh, and I guess I should just briefly, I'll introduce myself later. Uh, my name is Dr. Scott Stoll, and uh, I've been in the space of lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition for 18 years. And um, uh, when we do some introductions, I'll introduce myself. But what I'd like to, to start with, Kathy and Nina, is if you would just take a few minutes and kind of your journey and how it's led you into the work that you're doing, because I think that historical piece is really important. So maybe Kathy, uh, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Nina. Sure. So um, I have been a writer for a couple of decades now, probably longer. And I talked about waking up in your life and being as conscious and aware and really applying mindfulness in all areas of relationships, your uh, work life, your uh, spirituality, your friendships, everything. And I realized at a certain point that I didn't have much awareness around my food. And I thought, okay, Kathy, you are really being a hypocrite because you're writing about all this stuff, but you really haven't looked under the hood of where your food comes from. And so I, I thought to myself, this is something I really need to do. And I was looking at my dog one day and I started realizing that my dog is no different than any of the animals that are going through slaughterhouse lines. It was deeply disturbing. And as someone who, who tries to be mindful and make conscious choices, I realized that I had to rethink the way that I ate. 
So I ended up doing that over the course of about a year and a half, I became fully vegan, hundred percent plant-based and I started writing about it. Um, I didn't write about it in order to be a vegan advocate, certainly not an activist, but um, Oprah sort of zeroed in on that particular chapter of one of my books, Quantum Wellness, and then that just sort of exploded. And lo and behold, I have become <laughs> a vegan advocate and a voice for um, eating a plant-based diet because of the environment for animals and for human health. So it was something, it was a personal exploration that I brought on myself so that I wasn't a hypocrite and it turned out to be my life's work and my calling. So you've always been an educator, is that right? I've always been a writer. I've always been, I, before writing books, I was a meditation teacher. I gave uh, guided meditations to people who were going through a really hard time, whether they had cancer, uh, needed to lose weight, going through a terrible breakup, whatever it was. And then I sort of transitioned into writing about those things. And so I've always, I've always been interested in how to make things better, how to feel better, how to make the world better, how to improve. I'm constantly looking on how to improve and going plant-based seemed to be a, kind of a, a grand slam across the board. It wasn't just something I could do for my sense of uh, living according to my values, my spiritual compass. And when I say spiritual, I mean ethical. Um, but it was something that actually brought me health and I was able to get you know, to a healthy weight, my skin cleared up, I had more energy, I realized I live longer, like the blue zones, people in the blue zones, which I'm sure Nina will tell you about. Um, and so I wanted to share this because it seems like in a world where there are so many pressing problems, um, there are very few things we can do as individuals that will have such a huge effect, name most of all climate change. So when, when you know, all these studies keep coming out about how eating meat adds to climate change, I thought this is just an incredible opportunity to talk about eating vegan, not only for our own personal health and well-being, but for planetary health and well-being. It's, it's, a, it's an idea and a way of eating whose time has come. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the power of the plate. That The food that we put on our plate two or three times a day has incredible transformative power. And you are an educator. You write in such an um, amazing way that helps translate science into practical application. And I think that's one of the focuses that I, I would like to bring up today, both you and Nina, you're, you are really involved in the translation of the concept of plant-based nutrition and the science of plant-based nutrition into everyday life. And, and that's really the essence of change and something that I think is incredibly powerful. So we'll, we'll put that on the back burner to simmer for a minute and we'll come back to that. Um, Nina, would you please share with us a little bit about your background and, you know, just uh, something I wanted to point out before you start, I just uh, to share with the audience that Nina is a chef for the largest plant-based health system in the United States and the lead chef for the Blue Zone. So she has a tremendous opportunity to um, take the concepts of plant-based nutrition and make them absolutely delicious so that people would not want to go back to their traditional westernized diet. So please, Nina, share with us a little bit about your background, where you came from, and maybe what's motivating you to continue your work. Thank you, Dr. Stoll. You dug up my bodybuilding. How did you find <laughs> that? <laughs> it's been over 20 years, and it was really the impetus that brought me through the door of, I'll call it veganism, because I was natural bodybuilding, Venice Beach, hardcore, barefoot, you know, I was a beast at the time. I donkey calf raised 800 pounds. Wow. I have very strong legs. And literally one morning I woke up and my body did not want any form of animal flesh or animal byproduct. And what I mean by that, I would get nauseous. So I really, you know, kind of freaked out to say the least, because I was like, oh my gosh, I was of the school. You eat animal flesh to build muscle. And I thought, how am I going to do this? I'm too young. I'm not ready to retire. I'm not doing any drugs. I'm doing it all natural. But I did take the deep dive because that's my character. 
and I studied my sciences and, you know, I use my body as the lab. And what I found was I was stronger. My recovery time was faster. I felt better. So it wasn't like rocket science to me. I didn't have to go, something's wrong here. I just took a deeper dive. And because my dad is a, you know, a professional chef, not vegan, I really went in um, because I've been cooking since eight in the kitchen with my mom and dad. And if you have a catering business, there's always a pair of extra hands needed. I swore I'd never be a chef, never say never. And so with that, I really learned about plant proteins and the ability to better absorb food, my food as eating plant-based. And I just didn't look like didn't look back. I broke up with salmon and um, I was fine with it. And, you know, now let's fast speed it through all the things I did. I've attended two culinary schools focused on plant-based cooking, both raw, meaning not cooking anything over 118 degrees to keep all the enzymes intact. And then cooking for food as medicine, traditional Chinese medicine ther theory, um, Ayurveda. I did a year in naturopathy because I believed at the time I wanted to become a naturopathic doctor. That doesn't mean they're vegan. But what I learned was I would be more impactful if I taught people. Because as a chef, I love serving you. And it's nothing like being able to have you all come to my table and have me serve you the food I love to serve you. I say I cook food for you to live for, not to die for. And so that's where I am today. I'm very competitive still. So now I compete on the plate. Hence the competitions you've talked about I've been involved with. One of my hardest competitions or, or most challenging, I'll say, was for first to fifth graders. It's called food literacy. And every year they have the veggie of the year competition. And in 2020, we won chef champion and I had collard greens. Imagine trying to convince kids that want to eat collard greens. So I had to break it down. And I am just blessed to be here at Adventist Health. As you mentioned, we've recently acquired the Blue Zones the zones that were studied by Dan Buettner and National Geographic to better understand the commonalities of the, the zones they found of why people lived so long. And one of the main ones was plant slant. And the other one was the 80% rule, meaning stop eating when you're 80% full. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there because my life is a work in progress. I've been vegan over 20 years. I love it. And people are always like, what do I have to give up? And I'm like, you don't sacrifice anything. There are over 200,000 edible plants in our world. About 20 of those we eat and make up 90% of what everybody is involved in. So I love the fact I could take 365 days three times a day and give you a different edible plant if you gave me the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nina. That is beautiful and inspiring. And uh, you're absolutely right. We're all a work in progress. And you know, this dietary change is not a, like you mentioned, it's not a day when we just, it's a black or white, it's a continual evolution of a, a healthier and healthier diet. And over the last 18 years, even in my own life with my family, Every year, our diet is different than the year before, and I believe it's getting better every year. So we're continually learning. Um, I wanna just talk about two quick points. And uh, one, I'd like to just ask you and Kathy to address right up front, because it's the number one question related to a plant-based diet, is where do we get our protein? So um, perhaps, Nina, you can start and just take that deep dive and share with us how you answer that question, and then we'll come back to you, Kathy. Um, so we can get that right out of the way because it's uh, the answer is very easy and then we'll move on. So Nina, go ahead. Well, I think I always like to start off with, because I like to get people thinking, where does a gorilla get their protein? I mean, one of the strongest animals on the planet and they are not devoid of protein. Protein is in everything. And I think, you know, the myth about protein and it's, like it's not king, there's protein, there's carbohydrates, 
there's good fats. We need all those macronutrients along with the micronutrients, but most important, we need amino acids. I, so, so I really believe there needs to be a re-education in what all this talk is about with regards to protein. With that, all plants, edible plants, have complete amino acids. They may have less content compared to some things such as animal meat, but what are the animals eating naturally? Not when humans start to get involved and start feeding them things that they don't naturally eat. So as a bodybuilder, I, I had enough protein. It was the calories I had to make sure I was getting enough of and full variety on my plate. And so again, over 20 years, I'm still standing strong. And uh, you know, I, I always educate people, we need to take in the protein. It needs to be bioavailable. It needs to be easily digested so the body can utilize the amino acids. So that is where I stand. Great, thank you. And Kathy? I, I you know, when we talk about protein, we talk about, um, I like to talk about clean protein because if protein is a package, it's what you wanna consider what comes along with the protein. So protein uh, from animals, yes, you get a lot of protein, but you're also getting a lot of saturated fat and a lot of cholesterol and a lot of inflammatory protein that's <clears throat> problematic for your body. Um, so with plant-based protein, uh, you get it from beans, legumes, lentils, black-eyed peas, seeds, pumpkin seeds. Um, you get it from peanut butter. You get it from whole grains. That, like Nina says, it's in everything, but there are you know more in seeds and quinoa and beans and things like that. And you don't have to worry about mixing them because as long as you're eating a diverse diet over the course of a few days, you're getting, you're getting your grains and beans and you're gonna get all your amino acids. But with plant-based protein, you're not getting any cholesterol, zero, zilch. Cholesterol is a big, <laughs> a lot of people, you're getting very little saturated fat as long as you're eating you know, whole food, plant-based, you're not eating a ton of you know, coconut oil or, or you know, um, burgers that are you know, grilled with French fries and things like that. But you're, you're, so you're, you're getting clean protein. There's um, no, uh, arguably no uh, pathogens like E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, the things that come along with animal foods um, when you hear about lettuce having E. coli, that E. coli, it, it, the word coli is, comes from the word colon. It comes from an animal. And usually the lettuce is contaminated from uh, agricultural runoff. So you're not getting all the salmonella. You're not getting the um, envir environmental fallout. So plant protein does not create all the climate change gases that animal protein does. Um, and, and also plant protein is loaded with fiber. Fiber is, your, is just the nutritional superfood. Fiber goes into your system. First of all, it, it mixes with the liquid in your gut and it forms a gel, pushes against your, your stretch receptors and tells your brain, I'm full. So you don't have to keep eating. You just feel really satiated. And then that fiber pushes through your body and literally cleans out your system, pulling all the gunk from the sides of your colon and out your body. So it keeps your own body clean. So when we talk about protein, I like to think about clean protein, how to keep my body clean, how to keep the environment clean, how to keep it clean on my plate that I don't need you know, a hazmat suit to make sure that I'm not getting salmonella contamination. And also having a clean conscience, because I think now in this day, we really do see how animals are treated in slaughterhouses and in industrial um, uh, places where they're raised in close quarters. And 98% of our meat and dairy come from these places. And so when we're eating plant protein, we have a clean conscience. So all of those things put together, uh, to me, point to clean protein. And just a little bit of a word about, you know, say eggs, right? A lot of people eat eggs because I need my protein, so I got to eat my eggs. One egg has basically six uh, grams of protein. That's not that much. Uh, roughly three in the yolk, three in the, in the uh, white. 
where if you eat a cup of lentils, you're getting 17 grams of protein. And most people are not eating just one tiny cup of lentils. They're probably eating a couple of cups if you're having a nice um, lentil soup or something. And that's a lot of protein. Plus you're getting all the fiber and nutrition that comes along with lentils without all the cholesterol and saturated fat that you get with eggs. So I vote for clean protein. Yeah, thank you. That's an amazing answer. And I've always talked to my patients about the same thing that when we are choosing protein, we actually are choosing a package. And, you know, just to step back a bit for everyone that's uh, joining us today, you know, I think in the world today, we have we've thought about food in a very reductionistic way. We've broken food down into its macronutrient components and um, somehow, you know, believe that the macronutrients operate independently of everything else that's woven into food. In reality, our meals or our consumption of food on a daily basis really work like a symphony in our body. And either this, the symphony is in tune and beautiful or this symphony is desynchronous de and, and, uh, and, and it uh, you know, causes disruption in our cellular system. So Kathy is absolutely right. You know, on the negative side, animal protein is filled with all of these components from molecules like new, new 5GC uh, to the bacteria that she mentioned to antibiotic resistant bacteria that come from animal production, um, heme iron, which is oxidative, these, all of these negative things, which when you eat them within four hours in your body, they're having an impact. And they have done studies looking at people that have consumed um, animal-based proteins, uh, specifically endotoxins, which are this, the lining outside of a bacteria that are heat resistant. And as people consume that, within four hours, their inflammatory markers go up. But what's also very interesting, within those same four hours, people are experiencing social disconnectedness and depression. And it just confirms that within four hours, the food is impacting not only the inflammatory levels in your body, but your emotional well-being and how you perceive the world and relationships. And so it's just a small example as we step beyond the power of our plate to understand the impact of food on our bodies, on the relationships with others, on our relationship with animals and the food production system and the way that we're managing ground, which we may get into today, uh, as well as our relationship to environmental resources like soil that we're stewarding for future generations. And so your plate is actually a relationship opportunity. Um, and it's a beautiful relationship opportunity that can be absolutely delicious. And on the positive side, there are so many benefits to eating a plant-based protein. And you will always get enough protein. There was just a study released uh, recently that people consuming plant-based diets get between 30 and 70% extra protein on a, on a daily basis because every single plant has protein. It has all of the necessary amino acids, maybe not in the amounts that you need every day, but that combination of a well-planned plant-based diet will provide in excess of all the protein that you need with all the necessary amino acids. Um, so um, before I introduce myself, I can't help but go back to this one topic that you mentioned, Nina, that's so important. It's the idea of biodiversity, the diversity of plants. And, you know, the research shows that 75% of the food that we consume comes from 12 plants and five animals. So when people talk about, you know, the westernized diet and they don't want to give up their food, they're really not giving up that much, are they? You know, and it's 56% uh, of the diet is processed food, 32% are animals not produced the way that animals should live and, and uh, with exploitation of animals and resources. And only 12% are plants and 6% of that are like ketchup, juice, potatoes, not even real plants. So, you know, there's, I'd like to dispel this myth as well that there, people are giving up something when they're changing from a westernized dietary pattern to a plant-based or vegan pattern because the diversity is amazing. And both of you as chefs, I'd love to have you speak into this to help people um, gain perspective and maybe inspiration around this. So Nina, would you lead out for us, please? Sure. I, as a chef, my whole goal and desire is to feed people food to live for. I know it has to be delicious and it should already be nutritious. So that's not even a, you know, a second thought in it, but I always approach people with compassion. And when someone says, well, where do I start? How do I start? I always find out what they're currently eating, what their favorite foods or cuisines are. 
And I lean into them there because most people, as you said, Dr. Stoll, think they have to give something up. And when I can show them that they don't have to give anything up and they actually get to have more fun, imagine eating a dessert first in your meal course, because we want those sugars those more simple sugars to be digested and not get caught behind um, the savory dishes. And no one has ever complained. I specialized in vegan desserts in culinary school, both cooked and raw vegan. No one can, you know, ever complained when I offered them a dessert. They didn't say, where's the protein? They didn't say, where's the beef? They just devoured it. I made a avocado cacao pudding the other day for a catering and it had goji berries and blueberries and toasted coconut and people were just delighted. But my favorite cuisine to cook is Mexican because that's what I love to eat. And then I can go to Indian and Italian and Mediterranean. So when people see they don't give up the things they love and it's really all about flavor and texture and taste. And when they eat a meal and think they're not going to be full, as you said, and they're satiated before they can complete the meal, I think it's a real eye opener. So I lean in really hard to make dishes or offer dishes that are familiar to people before I introduce them to durian, you know, which you have to get past the smell for all the pudding goodness there. And, and I've been and have had success that way in the areas where I've competed and where I compete every day in the cafe on the plate. So I'm an activist on the plate um, for the animals, for our environment and for our health. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. And Kathy. Mm. Well, first of all, Scott, I love that you're calling me a, a chef, <laughs> but I'm definitely not a chef. I'm like the most simple eater in um, that I know. But I, when I write my books, there's always a chef who designs who design the uh, recipes because I just don't. I'm not. I'm not. You know, professional chef. But I love to eat. Like I am. I am from Georgia. I do not. I'm not into having a salad. You know, which I mean, a salad is great as long as it has warm stuff like falafel or you know some really good tender juicy bits all over it. But I like you know food that's going to be fulfilling that I can snarf down and you know really feel like I'm I'm getting um what everybody else is getting so I I I do my food is kind of the old-fashioned way in my mind I just think of my protein my starch and my vegetables you do not need to do that at all I just do it because that's how I grew up and I'm like I want something okay what am I going to get this protein base that I'm going to feel really fulfilled and so I'll have like a, a a bean soup that's like really you know got lots of vegetables in it I'll have a side salad and I'll have some sourdough bread that'll be my lunch you know um, for breakfast I'm right now I'm enjoying some yogurt with a little bit Bit of a granola and some uh, nut milk, macadamia milk with some blueberries. That's what I'm into now. And the yogurt. So just just to give you an idea, I am like I love anything creamy. Anything creamy. I I love cheese. I love yogurt. I love ice cream. I love uh, you know milks, all kinds of stuff. And Thank goodness that the, you know, there are so many options now. There are great plant-based yogurts made from almond milk, coconut milk, um, all kinds of uh, cheeses made from macadamia, uh, made from all kinds of nuts that are phenomenal. They're the kinds of cheeses that are great to melt on Mexican food or the fine kind that you have with cheese and crackers and wine ice creams that you would never know don't have any dairy milk that are I think so much better they taste cleaner and they're really rich and satisfying so I pretty much eat the way that I used to eat growing up but just tweaked and better with more variety like Nina was saying there's so many things that I wouldn't have had before I grew up having basically seven meals. You know, one night was chicken, green beans, mashed potatoes. Another night was meatloaf, peas, and rice. I mean, it was so boring. So now I have so many fantastic 
choices like, you know, spaghetti squash and, um, you know, all kinds of beans that I'd never heard of, Christmas beans, eye of the goat. I mean, there are things that are these beautiful um, beans that have been passed down through generations that are so rich and creamy and just like, uh, they're very, very satisfying. And, um, and then I, I also love going out. I love, I, I love, like Nina was saying, you know, you go out to Indian food or Ethiopian food, or um, there's some great restaurants that are purely plant-based. And actually my favorite restaurants, I'm going to one tonight in Los Angeles is a steakhouse. And now, you know, steakhouses are really restaurateurs are seeing that the culture is moving forward. The culture, the younger people want more plant-based food for the environmental reasons, for animal, um, animal protection, for their own bodies. And so now I go to steakhouses and they have a whole vegan menu. They have a tofu dish. They have a burger dish, whether it's Beyond or Impossible or Hungry Planet. There's just these fantastic burgers and pizzas and things like that. I, I don't eat like that all the time, but every once in a while, probably once a week, I like to go out and, and eat something very hearty. So there's all kinds of options that, um, that are just very, very satisfying. Oops, I don't hear you. Thank you. I was just trying to be quiet. Yeah, I was just simply saying that food was intended to be delicious. Food, healthy food is supposed to be delicious, satisfying and fulfilling. And, um, you know, just an interesting point for you all that are, are watching us today. There's a process called neuroadaptation by which your taste buds get hijacked by the sugar, fat and salt in our diet today. And over the course of two weeks to several months, your taste buds will begin to change. They'll begin to readapt to the flavors of a plant based diet. And you may actually go from not enjoying broccoli to craving broccoli over time. And so it's an important um, point because lots of people say, well, I don't like plants. And I just tell them, keep exposing your taste buds to plants and you'll begin craving plants. And also works the other way, Scott, I found is that the old stuff like dairy and meat becomes kind of gamey. Um, I, I've had several sort of mistakes in my life. I remember I was in an airport and I went to Starbucks and I ordered a, a soy latte and I walked away with it and I, I drank a sip of it and it, I, they must have forgotten and used real milk and it was so gamey. I had lost the taste for, for real dairy. It was just like putrid or something. It just, it was funny. And, um, and then I, I also ordered a tofu burrito at a place um, this couple of years ago, and I'm biting into, into it, and I was like, this tofu is just really dry and stringy, and it just is, you know, and it was chicken. And so the things that you you used to love, you move away from it, and it, it doesn't even taste good anymore. So it's, it's kind of nice to have those mistakes every once in a while, because I think, oh, wow, I really don't have the taste for uh, meat, dairy, and eggs anymore. It's gone. Yeah, that's exactly right. Your taste buds get recalibrated. That's mm -hmm. right. And then the sweet, salty becomes too sweet, too salty. The animals become kind of tasteless and actually don't make you feel good. And so it keeps pushing you toward plant, mm -hmm. a plant-based diet. I'm just going to take five minutes and introduce myself because... Uh, I realized I didn't, and I just will share a brief story that uh, I was trained as a traditional physician, physiatry, physical medicine, rehabilitation, practicing sports medicine um, at Lehigh University and with the United States bobsled team. Um, I had a history as a 1994 Olympic bobsled athlete, and that's how I ended up uh, continuing to work with the bobsled team and Olympic athletes. And uh, I was practicing, and I noticed that my patients continued to tell me they were falling apart. I thought it was the inevitable consequence of aging, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune diseases were the consequences of uh, genetics and family history, maybe a little bit of lifestyle, but it was just what happens as we get older. And that's why we have pharmacological intervention in medicine, which was my job to diagnose and intervene to manage the disease. Well, there was a day in my practice, a woman was sitting on my exam table and she said to me, Dr. Stoll, can you help me? I'm falling apart. And I just simply asked a question that day. I said, what does falling apart mean to you? And I was anticipating something on her past medical history list, a side effect medication, complications from a surgery. 
And she started in a place that I did not expect. She said, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is tired of taking care of my medical conditions. We're facing financial bankruptcy because of the cost of my medical care. I can't travel to see my grandchildren. I can't attend church or social activities. I'm depressed and I don't have any friends. And with tears running down her cheeks, she said, can you help me? And in that moment, I was running through my mind, all of my lectures, the binders of pharmacology, differential diagnosis, and I realized that I did not have any capacity or ability to help her restore her lost quality of life, which was directly related to the list of medical problems that were in front of me. That sent me on a personal learning journey about 18 years ago. For a couple of years, I dug deep into the research. I read all the diet books from the Atkins to the Zone and realized I was more confused at the end of that journey than when I started. Was it high fat, low fat? Uh, cabbage soup diet, eating cookies, taking a tapeworm pill to, uh, to plant a tapeworm in your gut, which is very real. You can do that today, but that's not the solution. And none of those really address the problem that I was seeing in my practice, which is progressive loss of quality of life related to lifestyle diseases. And so I began to go back to my uh, undergraduate education in biochemistry and um, and nutrition and read the literature. And I discovered that beautiful green thread through the literature that the more plants you eat, the healthier you become. And I thought, can it really be this easy? So I started using whole food plant-based diet and lifestyle interventions with my patients. And I saw things that I did not know were possible and nobody in medical school or residency ever taught me were possible. I saw heart disease reversed. I saw type two diabetes reversed. I saw MS symptoms completely resolved and people in remission. I saw people with rheumatoid arthritis return to normal life. Uh, incredible things happened in my practice. And so from there, um, I was invited to be on the scientific advisory board with Whole Foods at John, with John Mackey. We still um, do health immersions for their most unhealthy employees once a year where they send their most unhealthy people to spend a week with myself and my family. And we feed them healthy food and we teach them how to take care of their bodies. And we see incredible transformations in just a week, which really emphasizes the power of plants that when we do the right thing, our bodies have an incredible regenerative capacity. And I, I want you to walk away with that concept because that concept applies not only to your body, but I believe it also applies to our environment that when we practice the right principles, our environment, our earth also has regenerative capacity. Uh, from there, um, I started a not-for-profit called the Plantrition Project with uh, two partners to begin educating healthcare practitioners because I realized how challenging that was uh, to learn on my own. And we started conferences and we now have conferences in Los Angeles with about 1,200 healthcare practitioners from 40 countries, New York, non-COVID years. Uh, we helped start one in Australia. We have one coming up in Thailand. It will be an annual conference. I'm working with Prince Khalid in Saudi Arabia and doing conferences there. Um, started a journal. So lots of uh, amazing things um, as this momentum grows. And so, um, you know, I think that the most important thing that I have learned is that when you change what's on your plate and you change simple aspects of your life, getting seven, eight hours of sleep, moving more frequently, not letting stress uh, take over your life, eating whole food plant-based diet, miracles can actually happen. And those miracles are not only disease reversal, but it's vitality, it's energy, it's mental clarity, it's things like anxiety and depression drifting away and people seeing restoration of their lives in every way, they abound in every way. And I'm just gonna end with one short story of a woman that came to our immersion a number of years ago uh, and she seemed relatively thin and looked relatively healthy um, and she was 35 years old. But, you know, in getting to know her, we saw that she had uh, thyroid disease, she was depressed, she had no energy, uh, significant myofascial pain or mus muscle pain similar to fibromyalgia. Uh, as a mother, she was telling us that she didn't know how she would get up and make it through the day. Her husband had ulcerative colitis and was looking at a bowel resection surgery because of the inflammation in his bowels. And she came for a week and she learned and she saw how that she could feel better even in a week by changing her diet. She went home and applied those same principles. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention infertility. Six months later, um, she, uh, all of her symptoms have resolved. Her thyroid condition normalized. 
her husband's ulcerative colitis resolved and he canceled his surgery. One year later, she was pregnant and they had another little baby boy. Um, she and her husband began running races together. They become, became influencers in their community. She became an educator at work. And it's just an example of when we change what's on our plate, it not only changes internally what's happening, and we could go into great detail about angiogenesis, epigenetics, your microbiome, neuroinflammation, BDNF, the growth of new brain cells. So many things happen just in that short period of time when you change your diet, but it really changes the way you feel, changes your relationships with others, changes your relationships at work, changes opportunities, changes the, the food that you purchase, which is impacting farm families, impacting soil, impacting animal welfare. And if all of us do this together, we can radically transform our world in a very, very short period of time. And that's the hope-filled message. You know, we often hear negative messages about climate. We hear negative messages about healthcare, negative messages about the disease burden, obesity. But the good news and the hope-filled message is that if more and more people change what's on their plate, and we're seeing that already today, Nina and Kathy and myself have been in this a long time. And we will tell you in the last three to five years, there's a major global shift that is occurring. And so as more and more people make this shift, we will see the inherent regenerative capacity of systems begin to take over and we will see our world transformed. So um, Kathy and Nina, do you have anything that you would like to add before we shift into some Q&A? No, I just wanna, I just wanna underscore what you just said. It's so empowering and it's so exciting. And take it from a girl who grew up in Doraville, Georgia, who loves to, to nothing more than to eat and enjoy her life. It is just the single best thing I've ever done. And I, and that you can, you don't have to do something like this overnight. It took me about a year, year and a half to make the transition and I leaned into it. I'm a big believer in progress, not perfection. Just have the intention, start adding more plants in, crowd out the old food uh, rather than cutting it out. And little by little, you just keep getting more curious find dishes that you like, you lean into it more and more. And before you know it, you're plant-based and you're feeling fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. That's right. I love that. Process over perfection, progress over perfection. Yes. Nina? I'd just like to add, I love everything that's been said, this dialogue we've been having. I love right now the time we're in and I'm loving the food tech connection you know, whether it's AI or even the blockchain, which I'm studying, mm -hmm. there are so many dynamic ways we can look at one stopping world hunger and, you know, working to preserve and save our environment and be more mindful and compassionate as what I think we're stewards and guardians for the animals, our sentient beings. But what excites me so much that I believe our audience is the future and they will lead the charge. And so many things that they're doing right now can be applied to what we're talking about with I do envision, hopefully in my own time, a plant-based world where people are really excited to not just eat it, but thrive in it and make our world at large better. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And I have to pick up on the one point that you said because it's so important, but stewardship. You know, it's not a principle that's taught um, traditionally today, because we live in a consumer-based society, but stewardship is the mindset and the belief that we are taking care of something for future generations. And we have to translate ourselves into a stewardship mindset that we are caring for the earth, we're caring for the soil, we're caring for other people, caring for our families, we're caring for the animals that we've been placed over uh, in, in our world. And we're, we're tending these things with the intention of making them better and handing it all off to the next generation in better condition than when we received it. And so I wanna thank you for bringing that up. That is so, so important. Thank you. So we have a number of questions that um, I'd like to spend the last uh, 13 minutes uh, reviewing. And then I have a challenge for all of you that have joined us today. Um, so here's the first question. I'll, I'll leave this for either Kathy or Nina, um, whoever feels like you'd like to take this one on. It says, many people feel they aren't vegan activists. Do you feel we need to re-examine how we look at activism? There are some interesting ideas presented on the podcast Beyond Species. So um, let's just briefly talk about the idea of activism and how that looks. 
and um, and. Well, I, I'd love to say something because I'm I'm very active on Instagram, and I posted a um, uh, a graphic uh, a couple months ago that said I'm an imperfect vegan, and I listed the ways that I'm imperfect. Like you know, I made a mistake and had the burrito with the chicken or whatever. You know, there are things that happen, and I for the. For the large part, there were so much uh, uh, support and, and people saying, yeah, me too, me too. And it feels good to know you don't have to be perfect. But there's also, there are some hardcore activists that really pushed hard and said, no, you have to be perfect. It is time. You cannot qualify something and do it just kind of, sort of. And I just think as an activist, as an advocate for plant-based eating, for veganism, for the animals, for the environment, everything. I think we have to lead with kindness and we have to lead with allowing ourselves the space and time to find our way. As much as it's frustrating, you know, I think there are certain activists who just want things to happen overnight. When I first became vegan, I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. And then you realize, oh yeah, that doesn't work. It just turns people off. So I'm a big believer and we're talking about being kind to your body. We're talking about being kind to animals, kind to the earth. Let's be kind to each other and give each other support um, as we move forward. And I think that's the best kind of activism. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a really important question. Um, how careful should we be about representing the miracle of eating vegan plant-based? My understanding is that when the health benefits don't come or they don't come quickly enough, people move back to what they did before. Nina, do you want to take a crack at that first? Sure. I, you know, I, I do know from experience of over 20 years for myself that I've seen the daily, I know I can take a day and choose to eat, you know, even cleaner vegan food, if you will, my fruits up till noon and my lemon water and such. And, and then the wheat, I think we have to be careful. I lean in. I think we're all saying this. I have compassion, but I think education is so key to set people up for success where they are. And all of us here on this panel may be at a different place. So I'm really interested and intentional with finding out where the person is so I can set them on a track for success where they don't feel like I didn't succeed or, and the support system is so key because I've had to, you know, felt like I fell off the track, but it's okay to fall off the track because sometimes you realize how much better the results you're receiving are. So I, I think it has to be education for people individually where they're at and what they're ready for. I'm going to talk where they're ready and then add a little more, add a little more, you know, icing on the cake, but education and support and compassion are very important for me to help everyone achieve where they're at on their own journey. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nina. That's exactly right. It really is about education. I appreciate the, the question, Thomas, because it is very important. Um, I think the tendency in the plant-based space and even vegan space is that uh, people are so excited about the benefits that we often forget to inform people about the journey. And it is a journey. It's a, it's a journey that takes effort. It takes some self-discipline. It takes change, um, uh, intentional change. There are other people in our lives, uh, significant others at home and children that uh, are part of that change process. And so as Nina mentioned, it really is education. And as a physician working with patients um, in many different ways in my clinic and immersions um, and through our, our not-for-profit, we always try to help people understand that process. And I think when people understand the pro process, some of the potential pitfalls and how to navigate that process, and most importantly, to know that they're a part of a community and that they have our love and support through that change process I think then they can they can navigate some of those those ups and downs that always come with change. Um, I always like to advocate for the benefits that they will see, and I always teach people too that you know uh, many of us have, have as we grew up in a Western society unintentionally made unhealthy choices, and those unhealthy choices had consequences, and we built up a disease debt in our lives, just like a credit card debt. And in order to pay that back, we have to pay that back consistently in large chunks over time to eliminate 
the debt, the health, uh, the disease debt that we've accumulated. But with intentional daily choices, we can pay back that debt. And so uh, I, you know, I work with people that way and I tell them it's a well-planned, well-executed dietary plan over time that brings change. Um, so please. I want to add, I think it's important. I learned this through my years of bodybuilding over 10 years. It's important to insert small indulgences because when I let someone know, but you can have this small indulgence or this one day in the week, we're just going to go, you know, a little crazy, let's say, and have all your favorite plant-based foods that you've told me you liked from the other side and really have that opportunity to celebrate our successes and even celebrate some of the failures. But I've learned for me personally, and I've shared them this with others and seen great results is those small indulgences matter because they're small enough not to do too much damage. Yeah, thank you, that's right. Our brains don't like black and white uh, or they, our brains don't like when we say we can never have something, we actually end up craving and thinking about it more. So that's an excellent point. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, here's a good one. Are you frustrated by the morphine of plant-based to be more than just plants? Kathy, do you want to take that one on? Okay. Was the question about the word well, plant-based? So the question is really like, yeah, as we're seeing, you know, plant-based, the movement, uh -huh. we're developing lots of processed plants. And so oh. the question, are you frustrated by that change that we're seeing? Like burgers and sausage and things like that? Um, I guess it would be maybe those, but more like the, the plant-based chips, um, plant-based, some of those things that may actually be really, really unhealthy, but they oh. put plant-based to capitalize on the plant-based movement. I see. I never mind. I really don't. I'm like, you know, let's, let's get the word out there. Let's familiarize everybody with the, with the term. Let's, I'm never afraid of the V word vegan. I, I know a lot of people and certainly in the medical community want to talk about plant-based, not vegan. Um, and I just want to say that the difference between plant-based and vegan is that plant-based is a way of eating probably for health. So if someone says I'm plant-based, they're usually coming to the, this way of eating because they want to slim down. They want to get stronger for their athletic performance, or they're trying to reverse some uh, type two diabetes or heart disease, where if you're vegan, I always say I'm vegan because I, I'm very concerned, not only with my personal health, but I really am concerned with climate change. I'm very concerned with what happens to animals. It's more of a lifestyle all around body, mind, and soul kind of a thing. Um, and I don't mind processed food because I think it's, again, I'm a big believer in progress, not perfection and leaning in. So those burgers like Beyond Burgers or Impossible Burgers, they're definitely not health food, um, but they don't have any cholesterol. They have less saturated fat and they're not doing a fraction of the damage to the environment and they're hurting no animals. So it is a it is a progress step forward. And I think that the more someone gets into this lifestyle and maybe they buy a bag of chips that says plant based and still they're not happy. But you know what? It's it's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing something. It just sort of feeds your self-esteem that I'm consuming more plant based things that I'm familiarizing myself with things that I'm, I don't have to miss. I thought I was gonna go plant-based and not be able to have chips or dessert like Nina was saying, or you know, pizza or burgers or whatever. And now I realize, okay, I actually can pretty much have everything that I grew up loving. I'm just having plant-based versions of them. And as I lean forward more and more, which is sort of natural because your body's gonna start feeling better and better, I'm going to opt for more whole food, plant-based, less of that processed stuff. And uh, hopefully it'll get to the point where I'm pretty much, you know, all whole food, plant-based, except for the occasional indulgence. At the end of the week, I'll have a burger and a martini because the girl's got to enjoy her Friday night. <laughs> That's great. Those, those foods can be a, a first step of awareness and an introduction. Um, and then that way they can be very powerful. And a, a, a point of change. Um, I have, there's a question for me. I'll just answer it quickly. Uh, Dr. Sol, can you talk about your diet when you were an Olympic athlete and how it's changed over the years with the benefit of what you know? What advice would you give a young athlete regarding their diet? So when I was um, training for the Olympics at the Olympic Training Center, I was eating like every other athlete focused on protein, 
believing that because I was burning so many calories, I could have two dove bars at night and not understanding the consequences of those choices, even though I was very lean, very strong and very fast. Um, I've learned through the years and working with athletes that because they often have extraordinary physiology, they don't see the immediate consequences of their dietary choices. And so they don't understand that their dietary, dietary choices impact recovery, as Nina mentioned earlier, and the research shows that you know, delayed onset muscle soreness from uh, typical exercise is reduced by 50% on an athlete that is plant-based. Um, they don't understand that the food that they're eating is actually impacting their immune system. And there are countless stories throughout the history of athletics of athletes that were not able to compete in the pinnacle event, Super Bowls, Olympics, because of a cold um, GI issues, uh, some immune susceptibility that, that undermined all of their training. So I like to inform people that their immune system is directly impacted by their food. In fact, when someone eats four tablespoons of sugar, the natural killer cells that are responsible for fighting bacteria and viruses are suppressed for four hours. So little things like that can make a difference. Um, daily mood, uh, vitality and emotion are impacted by food. Inflammatory levels are impacted by food and reducing inflammation. And then finally, I talk about the regenerative capacity of our food, such as a serving of broccoli mobilizing the mesenchymal stem cells that are necessary for repairing muscle and connective tissue. And so there are um, many, many benefits. Um, and there's you know, several lectures that we could do on the benefits of a plant-based diet for athletes. And so you know, now is, uh, I'm 53 and exercising very hard. And I, I see the benefits because I can keep up with my young sons. I rarely get sore. I, I never get sick. And uh, I wish I knew this when I was back competing because I think it would have impacted uh, my life back then. Um, in the last couple of minutes, uh, Kathy and Nina, I'd just like to ask you to share, um, you know, something that you have learned recently that is both inspiring and hope-filled for our audience. Well, I'll just say that over the course of the last few years, um, people who identify as plant-based or vegan has gone up by 600%. So uh, I feel like the culture is moving that way. And I feel like things happen sort of in little gradual things. And then there's sort of a quantum leap. And it feels like we're on the tipping point because uh, the market has come up with so many incredible products. Entrepreneurs are starting restaurants and um, exposing more and more people to really delicious plant-based foods. And it feels like we're at a tipping point it feels like the culture is going to take uh, an irreversible change, a step forward. Uh, and I feel like I, uh, for the first time in a long time, I can actually imagine a world without uh, animal agriculture and all the suffering and climate change that it brings. So that's inspiring. Thank you, Kathy. That is inspiring. Thank you. Nina? I'm inspired by just as a culinarian, the number of peers and colleagues, both in the culinary and the healthcare industry that are really leaning forward to see a hospital in Lebanon that's gone all vegan, to be a part of an organization that is you know, working with our 23 hospitals to be more plant slant. And again, support all this with education and knowledge and, I think it's really important, Dr. Stoll, as you said, the immersion part of it to show people how to do it and to take away the fear or the thought of scarcity and to just embrace everything. I love the fact that our future and those that are leading the future here today with us can really have a huge impact that it's like that race we're in, you know, out on the um, track and you hand that baton over, but you know, you're going to win the race. And that's what I'm really inspired and excited about. And what I wake up for every morning to have that sense of purpose and knowing that I've gone from being weird to possibly being cool. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is great. Uh, and to all of you, you know, Jane and Seba, uh, Kathy, Nina, and myself all believe that you are the generation that has solutions and will usher in um, this kind of transformative era of plant-based nutrition 
uh, around the world. And so we believe in you and we want to invest in you. And that's why we're all here. And our challenge to you is that knowing that you are a part of the solution, we want to encourage you to uh, seek out uh, ideas and research them, help develop the research database, whether it's in medicine or engineering uh, or even in the culinary space. You have solutions that need to be researched and demonstrated. Um, there's also lots of companies that are in this space and technology and food development in healthcare. And I wanna encourage you as you're beginning to shape your future and looking at career opportunities, to look in this field and use your skills and abilities and creative ideas and innovation to help move this forward because this field, the power of your plate has transformative ability and um, we will see the world transform. So I want to thank all of you for your time, for joining us today. Kathy, Nina, it has been absolutely delightful to spend this hour with you. I'm so happy and blessed to get to know both of you and look forward to working with you in the future. And Jane and Seba, thank you so much for organizing this and being world changers.